Good morning. Welcome to the Affordable Care Fair. I'm Rogelio Sainz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Policy, and it is my honor to be serving as a moderator this morning. And I would very much like to appreciate uh, your time and your effort for coming out today despite the very cold weather. It probably would have been better to be at home in the toasty house and so forth, but uh, uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, I'll provide giving a few general overviews on, uh, on the to set the context, uh, and then I'll mention a few things that are, that are going on with the, with the fair as well. Uh, as, as we well know, the 2010 Affordable Care Act uh, was signed into law in uh, 2010. Uh, and despite this becoming a law and so forth, we have seen that there has been much effort to try to do away, to scrap, to change, to modify, to delay the Affordable Care Act. So there's a lot of misinformation that has also been taking place uh, over the course of, uh, of its life. Uh, despite, and, and the, uh, the last uh, um, month or so, we've had the massive uh, problems with the web page, uh, which has contributed a lot to the negativity associated with the uh, Affordable Care Act. Despite uh, the, the problems with the we website, despite uh, the efforts that have been put forth to try to uh, do away with the, the Affordable Care Act or delay it, we know that this is uh, much, much, much better than what the, the system that we have in place that for many people uh, here in, in our country, in, in our state, as well as in our community, uh, translates to not having any health care at all. Uh, so that uh, uh, for many people, it is going to be uh, very much of a blessing uh, for individuals who have uh, no uh, access to health care or limited health, uh, access to health care. Uh, and in, again, despite the fact that it's not the ideal, in many ways it helps us get to the ideal of seeing uh, health care as a human right, something that we as, as humans should be able to, uh, to, uh, to access. Um, and uh, just uh, briefly, some, some statistics uh, related to, to the city of San Antonio. Here in San Antonio, there are about one out of every five individuals here in our community lack uh, uh, health insurance. Among the Latino population, it's 25%, so one out of every four. Uh, individuals who are young between the ages of 19 and 25 have a high prevalence of not having uh, uh, health care insurance. About 37% uh, uh, of individuals who uh, are 19 to uh, 25 do not have health care insurance. Individuals that are non-citizens, about 52%, about one out of every two do not have health care insurance. Uh, individuals with low levels of education, um, uh, thirty percent or so uh, for high school graduates, thirty-eight percent for individuals who are not high school graduates. The employed, even people who are working, thirty-eight percent of the employed uh, do not have uh, health care uh, insurance. The unemployed, about fifty-six percent. So you can see that, despite overall one out of five being uninsured, in reality there are segments of our community that have very serious needs for uh, the uh, health care uh, insurance, and the Affordable Care uh, um, Act in many ways provides uh, relief for, for these individuals. A couple of things going on here. Um, we have the, uh, the free enrollment uh, council, uh, counselors uh, with uh, Communicare that are, that are uh, outside. We also have free flu shots by, the univer by University Hospital, uh, University Health. Uh, then we also We'll have a raffle, a $50 raffle from HEB that uh, individuals can register in the first table there uh, right outside so, uh, so um, uh, you can be in the drawing. Now what I want to do is, uh, is introduce the, uh, the, uh, our panelists, and then I will ask after I've introduced each one, uh, I will ask each one to give uh, three to five minute uh, uh, remarks. First, on my far left, we have uh, Greg Geisman who is uh, from the community, who is the CEO of the uh, Community First uh, Health uh, Plans. Uh, welcome, Greg. Then we also have uh, District 5 Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez. Then we also have uh, Kiara Sherard from uh, Communicare. Welcome. And then we also have Jose Ibarra from Enroll America. Thank you very much. And then, so if I can ask each of you three to five minutes to give a little bit of, a, of your thoughts here. Five minutes may be a little short for me. Okay. 
Thank you for the opportunity to participate. And again, I also appreciate everyone braving the weather to come out and join us this morning. People ask me from the <laughs> perspective, what is our perspective or issues with the Affordable Care Act? And Community First is somewhat unique in that although we are a health plan, a licensed health plan in the state, we provide coverage to 88,000 Medicaid lives, 30,000 CHIP lives, another 18,000 commercial lives. We are provider owned. University Health System owns us and we are local in the community. Our offices are here, all of our employees live here. And when people ask me that question from that perspective as an insurance professional as well as a provider, I always go back to the goals and the intent of the Affordable Care Act. And there are really two main goals uh, in the legislation when it was created several <coughs> years ago. The first was to guarantee affordable insurance for nearly all Americans. And there was really three ways to do that. One was to set up the insurance exchanges in every state, which we're here to talk about today. And the second was to provide financial help and subsidies for those to, to pay the premiums associated with those products and or expand the Medicaid program to help uh, other low-income individuals. And the third and most significant way of increasing that access was to require that insurers had to provide coverage to an individual and they couldn't limit their coverage, they couldn't kick them out, they couldn't offer any different benefits if they were sick and needed a lot of services. The second critical goal, and it's a longer term goal, was to improve the efficiency and the quality outcomes. But we'll spend some time, more time, talking about the first issue, the access, because that's, that's why we're here. And, and as the Dean alluded to, there's been much debate and issue regarding the strategies and obviously problems with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. You can't argue with the goals in terms of providing access to folks. From community first perspectives, we believe those goals are real, legitimate, they are important to our community, and they match very well with the mission of Community First. Although we're an insurance company, our mission is to transition uninsured or uninsured individuals in Bear County to more comprehensive benefit designs. That's why we're very supportive and very bullish on the Affordable Care Act, and I would agree with you, Dean, it is a step in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and for being here. And I'm Shirley Gonzalez, and I represent District 5. It's where we sit right here, and it includes most of the near west side uh, and includes part of the south side. And, and so I'm here today as a representative for our community uh, because we do represent a very high number of uninsured people, adults. Um, many of the children, most of the children in our community are covered through different programs but it's the adults who are not, uh, their parents and their grandparents. And so we all know that as families, we have to support each other. And if the adults are sick or the grandparents are sick, the child is not gonna be well, regardless of how much coverage the child has. So uh, I'm, I'm here because I really want to encourage everybody to participate in programs that are available uh, as an, an employer, uh, it was very critical for me to make sure that our employees were covered, that they had some sort of coverage so that they could, that every aspect of their lives were covered so that their employee employment was secure, um, that their health coverage could be secure. Uh, and so we were working on that. And as, as a, just as a private citizen, it's very, it, it can be very complicated. And so we hope that uh, in, through our office and through the work that we do in, in our district offices, we have one at Las Palmas, and one at Nogalitos and one at City Hall, uh, we can take the steps that are necessary for our community uh, to enroll and, and just sort of hold their hands. There's many, many people here today that can help you enroll. We don't enroll in City Hall. We're not, we don't have that, that service. Um, but we can direct people. Um, we can get our community leaders to come to our offices so we can take the extra steps necessary. Uh, it's compli it can be complicated, uh, I think, and, and in fact, um, it can be especially complicated when we have language barriers. So we're here to help with that as well. Um, I know that all of the information is equally provided in Spanish, but just the language itself uh, can be. And so we're here to just sort of break it down for everybody. Know that, that your uh, council people are, and the city is here to help wherever necessary. Um, to facilitate uh, people enrolling. And uh, here in, in District 5, um, we do have a very large uh, Spanish-speaking population, and we have a very large uh, children's population. We have a number of, of people under the age of 18. And so 
we're protecting every member of their family. And so we hope that everybody that um, is here today would consider uh, enrolling, asking the questions that, are, that you need to ask. And, and if you can't get the answer that you need, somebody here will be here to help you. So thank you all for being here and for participating in today's uh, forum. Hello, I'm Kiara Sherrard with Community Care Health Centers, and um, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer. So I oversee um, health plan contracts and billing of insurance, and now I have a new department, the Health Exchange Department. Uh, Community Care Health Centers is a federally qualified health center, which means that we receive funding uh, from the federal government to provide health care to uninsured people. Um, so in our clinics, we have dental services, primary care, pediatrics, behavioral health. Uh, we try to provide as much comprehensive primary care as possible within our clinics. Um, but we still struggle to be able to uh, coordinate care for patients who need specialty care. Uh, you know, we can only do so much in our clinics. And so we, ha we see about 45,000 um, visits a year, and about 60% of our patients are uninsured, so about 24,000 people. Uh, so we did receive a grant uh, to help fund uh, hiring certified application counselors, and we have hired six of them that are dedicated just to enrolling people, and then 14 additional staff members, including myself, have become certified to try to uh, reach as many of our patients as possible who might be eligible. Uh, we've been enrolling or attempting to enroll since October 1st. Um, the website is working much, much better now. We've, we've assisted uh, over 700 people um, with questions and with filling out the application and actually submitted over 500. Um, we uh, see insured patients also. Uh, we see Medicare patients, Medicaid. Um, we work with Community First. We see a lot of their patients. Uh, we've been working a lot with community partners since the, since before October 1st to try to coordinate our efforts and uh, not duplicate efforts. We've been working with University Health System, with Enroll America. Um, so this community has really come together, its leaders, as far as trying to uh, coordinate, put on events like this, trying to reach as many people as possible because we do have more than 300,000 uninsured in Bear County alone. Uh, we also have clinics in Hayes County, so uh, one of our staff members is out there. Um, so we're really hoping to see people have access to more, better, more comprehensive care um, than just the things that we can provide and the partners that we have who help us get, those, get the care for those patients. So we're very excited about um, next year. Thank you. Right. Hello, I'm Joey Barra, and I'm with an organization called Enroll America. So Enroll America is a uh, Washington, D.C.-based 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we're nonpartisan, nonpolitical, um, with the uh, mission of educating the community about their options under the Affordable Care Act. And so um, we have operations uh, across 13 states in the country, uh, namely states that have chosen not to uh, implement the marketplaces and, and do outreach on their own. And so, um, so Enroll America in, um, in, uh, last fall, along with the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, found that nearly 78% of, uh, of folks polled um, did not know what the Affordable Care Act was and, and what uh, essentially the bill offered to them. And so, um, so, so our, our direct mission was to, uh, to educate folks and make sure that they fully understood um, the resources available to them under the bill. And so what, what we're finding is that um, a, a recent poll done uh, back in October found that, that that number has gone down to 49%. And so, um, so better, but, but still just uh, an outstanding uh, a number of folks who, who don't know um, what's available to them. And so the, the, the number, the, the, the top two questions that we're finding that folks uh, do not know is um, one, what, what is the bill? Um, two, um, where, where can I go to enroll? And so, so we work with partners such as CommuniCare, uh, university health systems, um, Centromed, um, ACOG, the, the folks who are enrolling people um, here in the county 
and uh, and we try to educate folks and uh, and funnel these people to to speak to to the the experts that are enrolling people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we've had an opportunity to uh, hear from each of our speakers regarding some of the uh, issues that they're working with, some of their services that they provide, and so forth. Uh, the next part of the, of the program, what we will be doing is I'll be asking each of them a series of uh, questions. And then after that, we'll open it up for, uh, for question and answers from the, uh, from the audience. So we're going to start, first of all, with, uh, with Jose. And uh, you, we know that uh, with the uh, Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of people that are going to benefit for, uh, from it, there are certain individuals, for example, individuals who are not U.S. citizens that will not uh, uh, have access to, to, uh, um, to health care. Are there any other ways in which uh, individuals that are not citizens can access health care? Um, the, the answer, quite simply, is yes. And, um, and, and I will also say that, uh, that when we are doing our outreach in the communities, we are encouraging all uninsured to, to, to seek out their options under the Affordable Care Act um, and, and to speak with one of the, the, the local groups um, enrolling folks. And, so, um, and, and, and this goes especially for the undocumented community. And so we do know that, um, that we have a, a large number of mixed status families um, in this community, and um, and so for a lot of these families, although the the parents may not qualify um, for the marketplaces, their children might qualify for an insurance plan under the marketplaces. Their children might qualify for programs like CHIP. And then um, when these parents are, are speaking to organizations like Community Care or University Health Systems, they're they're also able to find uh, alternative methods of of healthcare for themselves. And these individuals can be assured that they're not going to fear any kind of a retaliation or any kind of identification and, and so forth of their status? Yeah, absolutely. So for folks who are, who are entering their, their information um, into the marketplaces or enrolling their children for CHIP, they, they, they can um, definitely be confident that their information is not being shared with, um, with um, enforcement agencies or, or agencies like that. And, um, and I, I can let... Um, um, Kiana here, or Kiara, speak about uh, about community cares. But as far as I know, the, um, none of our community-based organizations here are sharing information with uh, with law enforcement. We, we want to make sure that um, that these folks have access to uh, to affordable health care. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. Uh, the next question uh, will be uh, to uh, to Greg, and that is, uh, what is the relationship between the University Health Systems Care Link and community uh, clinic programs? like Communicare and the CHIP STAR uh, Medicaid program for children with insurance available through the ACA? Um, the CareLink program is sponsored and run by University Health System. That is a financial assistance program. It is not insurance. And that program is available to low-income Bear County residents. Uh, there are various providers in that network of folks in that network for the CareLink folks to go to, UHS, Communicare, and things like that. It does operate a little bit like an insurance company that you have to pick a PCP, you have to go to spe specific providers. The CHIP and the Medicaid program are government-sponsored insurance programs, and they are regulated by the state of Texas. They're regulated by the, by the Department of Insurance and Health and Health and Human Services Commission, in which an individual applies to the state, the state determines the eligibility, and the state then has relationships with managed care organizations to arrange a series of benefits associated with the Medicaid and CHIP program through a series of contracted providers. Okay, thank you very much. The next question will go to the councilwoman, and it is, what can the city and local policymakers do to foster a healthy community? Well, I'll, I'll try and, and make it a, a, a little more personal. And for those of us that live in, in District 5, uh, we know we have a large number of parks. Uh, and yet um, they're not getting used because uh, we have poor quality sidewalks and the streets are not as, as well as, as maintained as they could be. So from the city's perspective, we're trying to be a little more uh, proactive in people's health and wellness by improving our parks and improving our sidewalks. Uh, and so we've got, you know, that angle where we're working on prevention. Uh, but, you know, on, on a more personal level, I know that um, when people come to our council offices, they're often already in a situation where they're desperate. 
uh, where they're, they need help and they need it now. And so um, we are hoping that by having a, a, a program like this one, uh, we can assist people, first of all, before they get to a point where they're so sick um, that they're going to the emergency room at, at, you know, late at night. Uh, and, and hopefully we can steer families in a direction where we're covering their overall wellness. So as a city, we're providing better streets and lighting and improving the parks so that they can enjoy them more and have a general feeling of wellness. And on, as a, on a much larger level, we can enroll people in, in affordable care programs um, so they're not uh, so sick and so desperate and coming to us when, when we are not as able to help them. Uh, so, and, and that's a, a, a very difficult situation to be in, and I'm sure that many of the panelists here can attest to that, that the, by the time people come, uh, they, are, are, they are very sick. And so hopefully we can prevent that. And, and that's one of the ways that the city can, can get involved um, at, the very, at the ground roots level at the very beginning of this program and enroll people and, and take care of their, their whole families. Yeah, and the, uh, the preventive uh, care is very important, as, as is the parks and so forth, because we know here in San Antonio we have a um, high level of obesity, for example, uh, and then so parks provide that, uh, that uh, venue where people can walk and get, get exercise and, and so forth. And it is a, it's a priority of mine to improve our, our parks uh, because we have a lot of them here in, the, in this district, better than in the other parts mm -hmm. of the city where you just have one or two very large parks. We have many small parks. And uh, I think that's really an ideal situation to be in where you don't have to travel too far. You can walk to your local park uh, and um, bring your children and enjoy the playgrounds and then you know just walk back home. And, and hopefully there's a, a grocery store nearby and you're picking up some healthy food. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and, and it's just an overall program. And so when we bring these um, a, a Affordable Care Act to, to people, it, it, it covers them completely. And so that's really where we're, what we're after with something like this and how the city can help um, take care of people just in general. Shirley, you mentioned the access to uh, quality uh, food in terms of uh, vegetables and fruits and so forth. Are there any efforts to try to to make those uh, um, uh, goods more accessible to individuals? We've we've heard of the the food deserts and and things like that. Yes, and we we definitely have that that situation here in in our uh, in our district. We're trying to get more uh, farmers markets um, and and teaching people how to grow their own. Uh, plants and, and of their their own vegetables rather and you know this this whole area used to be farming community not so many generations back many people that are uh, you know just a little older than me remember that this was all farmland at one time so we still have very fertile soil and we're pe people are te are learning to grow their own vegetables and how to take care of themselves uh, so we don't have to rely on such uh, larger programs to help it but this is a um, this is important and I think that uh, at, a, at our council office, we really have people coming in every day asking for assistance um, with, often it's uh, with CPS or with SAWS or with bills and mortgages and, uh, or making payments. And so we can offer assistance at every level and, and help people through the difficulty of filling out forms. And nobody likes to fill out forms. I personally hate filling out forms. Um, my parents... As soon as I was old enough, they said, hey, fill out this form. I, I don't want to fill out the forms. Um, so, uh, but, and that's why sometimes it just does help if we're sitting talking and saying, oh, well, what, um, what's your name? What, and give you, you're kind of going through the list. And in the meanwhile, you're having a conversation <laughs> and you make it a little bit more pleasant than just sitting there and having to fill it out. So um, having fairs like this one you know, encourages a little bit of, of camaraderie and their snacks and you make it a little more interesting than having to sit online and, and do the details, but that's also available. Okay, thank you. The next question will be for Kira. And uh, we know that uh, people who are uh, currently, the way we have the system, people who are uh, currently uninsured and have health issues uh, find it extremely difficult because of cost and so forth to get, gain access to health care. Um, what about with the Affordable Care Act for those individuals and who have um, uh, pre-existing conditions? Uh, what is their situation with the Affordable Care Act? Well, essentially, the Affordable Care Act has done away with uh, the ability for insurance companies to deny coverage to people based on pre-existing conditions or to uh, delay coverage for certain conditions. Uh, typically, uh, what has happened in the past is that people with pre-existing conditions 
um, if there's a that's included in an insurance policy, they may have to wait a year before they can get any kind of coverage for a particular condition. Um, and those conditions are usually very serious ones, such as HIV, cancer, uh, you know, very serious things that not only do you not want to wait to get care because you're ill and you need the care, but you can actually die from these things if you don't get the care that you need. Um, the, uh, in addition to tax credits and subsidies to help pay for premiums for people who qualify based on their income, they can also qualify for uh, cost-sharing assistance. So to pay um, the monthly premium uh, based on your income can be very inexpensive. And what we found when we're enrolling the people that are patients at our clinics is they, they pay very, very little for their premiums. But in addition to that, um, if they have a plan uh, that is, a, say, a silver plan and it only covers 70% of the cost, uh, the, the patient typically has to pay 30%. Well, most of the people who are qualifying for subsidies for premiums will also qualify for assistance for paying that 30%. Um, and I actually have a, a true story about a, uh, prior to working for CommuniCare, I worked for an oncology group. And uh, we ha had a patient, a 27-year-old lady who came to be seen, and she had been having uh, breast pain for quite some time uh, when she was breastfeeding. And uh, her husband had been laid off, so she was uninsured for over a year. She had gone to the doctor once about the breast pain, and uh, basically he, he just said, oh, it's from, from breastfeeding and it will pass. And by the time she came to see our physicians and was diagnosed, she, her breast cancer had spread through her body. And uh, she w we put her on chemotherapy. The uh, insurance denied the uh, treatment stating that it was a pre-existing condition. Uh, fortunately, we were able to dispute that because she actually was not diagnosed until after she got the coverage. Um, but because she waited over a year to be seen, um, that, that lady is no longer alive. And she had two babies. And these are the kind of people that this will help. Thank you very much. Um, the next question will be to uh, Jose. And we've heard a lot with, uh, um, at one point in time, the president had, uh, had uh, indicated that people who had current insurance could keep their, their current insurance. And there we saw, uh, once you get into the details and so forth, uh, this was a, a concern. And there was a, there's been a lot of uh, debate over this about whether individuals who have their current uh, health care insurance if they can keep it even though it doesn't meet the minimum requirements. Could you address this issue, please? Um, sure. So the, uh, again, this, the, the simple answer to um, can folks who currently have health insurance keep their health insurance even if it doesn't meet minimum standards, they, the, the answer is yes, they can. Um, but what we recommend to folks is, um, is to treat your, your health coverage like any other major, pur any other major purchase, like a, like you would purchasing a, a vehicle or a, a house or another big purchase um, like this. Um, uh, essentially, um, when you go into the marketplace, you'll find that, um, that plans that do meet minimum standards, and there are 10 minimum criteria um, that, that, that basically qualify an, an insurance plan for, for, for meeting uh, minimum standards, you'll, you'll find that the prices are, are either comparable or in, in most cases even lower. And uh, you know, to share a story, we had a, a gentleman this past Thursday come into uh, to one of our events. Um, currently had health insurance, but uh, but wanted to check his options. And so uh, so he went and, and checked his options for for his family, a family of four. And what he found was that um, his current plan um, was better than the ones in the marketplace. But um, but he was satisfied. He he said um, he didn't want to. Um, to leave anything unturned, um, he was happy that that he took the time to um, to check out the prices and and, and essentially shop around. Um, so so I would encourage um, everyone, um, especially folks who who insurance plans uh, do not meet minimum standards, to um, to at the very least shop around. Um, as Kiara mentioned, um, the the website is is fully functional now. We've had folks um, basically breeze through and, and and get through to the part where. They're able to shop for plans in about 30 minutes, and um, 
and and so I uh, again encourage you to go on, uh, um, find out for yourself. Um, you know, turn off the TV, turn off the radio, and um, and and look it up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question will be for uh, Greg. And as uh, we've gotten information uh, regarding the Affordable uh, Care Act, uh, we, hear, we keep hearing about these rebates that, uh, that exist and so forth. How do people go about uh, accessing those and who are the individuals that would be eligible for them? Well, well really, there, there's two types of rebates or subsidies available to, to individuals. As you purchase insurance, there's a couple of things you need to worry about. One is to pay the premium to the insurance company, and then the other issue is to pay whatever copay or coinsurance that is necessary whenever you receive services. And as Kira alluded to, there's really two types. The first on the, on the premium, to help you pay the amount that you need to pay to the insurance company, if your income is between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level, there are subsidies available for that. If you pick a silver plan, and your income is between 100 and 250 percent, there's what's called a cost reduction subsidy, in which basically that helps you pay those co-payments and those deductibles when, at the time whenever you need services. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question will be to Kira. How does a person determine what uh, she or he or the family and children need uh, in order to be insured? based uh, mainly on your health status. Um, someone who is a young person in their 20s who has no chronic illnesses uh, might want to pick a plan that has a uh, lower premium um, and a higher out-of-pocket uh, when they go to see the doctor because they don't need to go that often. So they'll pay less on a monthly basis. Um, they may only go once or twice a year. Um, for an annual checkup because they're healthy. Uh, someone who has something like <coughs> diabetes who needs to, to be seeing the doctor a lot more often or kids with asthma uh, might want to pick a plan that has a higher premium on a monthly basis, but then they pay less every time they go to see the doctor. Um, that's something that you can, that people can discuss when they're enrolling uh, like with our CACs, um, especially if you're enrolling like with, with one of our clinics or if you go to Centromed or people who are knowledgeable about uh, health coverage and, and medical needs, you can, you can customize to a certain extent what plan you choose um, once you find out that you qualify um, based on you know, how often you need to see the doctor, what kind of medicines you take. Um, different plans have different uh, formularies of drugs that they cover. <coughs> Um, so that's where I think the, uh, the assistance with the enrollment really comes in, into play um, beyond just do I qualify or not, but what's the best coverage for me? What do I need? How often do I need to see the doctor? Who, you know, what kind of specialists and hospitals are in the network with this plan? Um, there's a lot of assistance okay. that you can get. All right. Thank you. Let's see. The, uh, the next question goes to... Um, um, to Jose, and we often hear with uh, young people uh, saying they're, they're inv invincible in many ways, and particularly with, with health individuals saying, I barely get sick, uh, and in some ways the economy has really hurt individuals who are, who are uh, young adults and so forth, uh, so the economic resources that they have is limited. We've even seen particular groups out there that have tried to encourage uh, college students and, and young adults to forego uh, uh, this insurance because it's not uh, beneficial uh, for them and so forth. Could you address that issue, please? Um, sure. So um, I, I do see some young folks here, and um, the, the, the rest of us, we were young and invincible at, at one time. And, um, and, and so it, 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 I would say it is important for, for young folks to um, explore their options. And, um, and to check on the marketplace. Um, there, there are plans that are specifically um, geared for young folks up to age 30 um, called catastrophic plans. And so it, essentially these plans are for, um, to, to, to cover young individuals for, for catastrophic, catastrophic events. Um, you know, if you're in a car accident on the, on the way home, if you find out that, that, that something is, um, is, is wrong, like a, a tumor or cancer, if you're attending class and you accidentally fall down the stairs. Um, so so in any kind of those, those big, um, you know, unexpected accidents. Um, 
So, so, and those plans are largely affordable. Um, and, and, and so those plans run, you know, $30 on average. Um, so, so there is no uh, assistance for, uh, for those plans because they're, they're um, essentially affordable um, already. Um, I, I, I will share my own story. When, uh, when I was just out of college, um, right before I started um, my first job, I was, I was left uninsured. I, I was in between that period um, where, where I was uh, covered through the, the basic coverage to the university and before um, I received employer coverage. And, um, and uh, I wound up getting the, the whole right side of my face paralyzed. And, um, and I was, I was um, um, very in shape at that point. I, would, you know, I was, I was uh, in the Marines at the same time uh, um, where I had just gotten out, um, was running five times a day. You know, I thought I was invincible. And, um, and for me, um, if it wasn't through sheer luck or, or you know, grace of God, however, however you want to mention it, that, that I met a doctor in the emergency room who, um, who decided to, uh, to take me under his wing and care for him, uh, you know, I, I would have been um, laced with, uh, with, with huge amounts of debts to, um, to, to cover me. So um, that, that's my story. Uh, um, it, it could happen to... Uh, um, things can happen to young people, uh, anybody, at, at, any, at any time. So, um, so young folks um, it would definitely understand the, the feeling of being invincible. I, I would say don't, um, don't put that to chance. Um, well, so, and uh, individuals, if, um, young adults, if their parents have insurance, yeah, is there so, any way that so they can if, also get that? If your parents have insurance, um, young folks up to age 26 can, can be covered under their parents' insurance. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, let's see, the next question will go to Akira. Uh, and we know that uh, there are a number of states around the country that have not expanded uh, Medicaid, and our own state is, uh, is one of these. Uh, are there any organizations, or what are organizations do, doing, if anything, to address uh, these kinds of shortcomings that uh, come about with not expanding Medicaid? This is a topic that's, that's come up in just about every <laughs> Every meeting or any any uh, committee that I've attended, um, because we do have a gap in coverage for uh, people who are not citizens or who may uh, fall into that that hole where they don't qualify for Medicaid or CHIP um, or the health exchange. Um, as I mentioned, Community Care is a federally qualified health center uh, that receives federal funding for to provide care to uninsured people. Uh, Centromed is another organization in Bear County that uh, is uh, similar to us. Um, we expect that at some point that that funding will be decreased, but not gone. Uh, we still uh, will be able to provide care to people who, uh, who qualify based on income. They receive care at our clinics or at a place like Centromed uh, at a very low cost. They can come in and have a visit, have lab work done, uh, have a basic x-ray, uh, we will continue to do that uh, beyond 2014. Um, also, we partner with uh, University Health System has a program called CareLink. Uh, we see those patients. Some of those patients uh, will qualify for the health exchange and some will not. So uh, that program is also not going away. Uh, we partner with uh, foundations like the Komen Foundation, uh, for women to have uh, breast cancer screenings. Um, so all of the, the programs that we participate with and the funding that we get to see uninsured patients is not going to go okay. away okay. because of the Affordable yeah. Care Act. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for answering these questions. And before we open it up for uh, the audience, if uh, I'll go around, the, uh, go, go around the, with the panelists here, if there are any additional remarks that they would like to make. I think there, we also need to, to recognize that as we talk about the Affordable Care Act, it really isn't a one-size-fits-all. There really are 50 Affordable Care Acts, depending upon which state you're in, because the states had significant latitude in determining how the Affordable Care Act was going to be rolled out in that state. They determined whether they were going to run the insurance exchange. They determined what the benefit design was going to be for those benefits in addition to the essential benefits. 
and as you know, and they decided whether to expand Medicaid or not. And as you know, in Texas, Texas decided, as did 36 other states, to allow the federal government to set up the exchange, and it decided not to expand Medicaid. Also, the Affordable Care Act, a lot of parts of it have already been implemented. There are things that have been done to date in terms of expanding coverage to include dependent children until they're 26, requiring insurers to spend a certain percentage of their premium on medical care. If not, they need to refund that back to, to the subscribers in terms of some limits and benefit designs associated with children. So the Affordable Care Act is a great big thing, and a lot of the components have already been implemented. And Texas has the ability to make certain decisions on itself, and those decisions you know, have led to some of the issues that Kira and the folks have talked about here today. So first, I just want to thank everybody that came out and to all the volunteers that came today, my staff that, that comes on Saturdays to, to work um, and, and represent our, our community and to be also uh, an advocate for something like the Affordable Care uh, Program. And uh, for, for, for everybody that's, that's here trying to inform themselves to improve their uh, lives and their families, it, it really is important uh, every step of the way. I mean, every person that enrolls in our community um, is showing that they're protecting their families. And, and as a council person, what I'm really most concerned about is that we have a healthy community that's thriving, that's growing, uh, and that is, first, and also taking advantage of the services that are available. Uh, and so there is often, uh, you know, a distrust uh, amongst our community members when we have big programs like this one, or even in, for in city government. And so this is an opportunity, I think, to really ask the questions, to get informed, and to also um, let us let us help you. So, um, uh, you know, I always get nervous. I say, we're the government, we're here to help. But, <laughs> but we really do want to uh, encourage everybody to enroll and to ask the questions. And as much as, as we can through our uh, offices, and by the way, this is, you know, our office, our city hall, District 5 office. I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire council, uh, just for us. Um, and because we do believe that we have, and I'm here because we, we have such a large number of uninsured people in our community. And, and we also have a, a very... Uh, elderly community and a very, um, in general, uh, sicker than other places. So we want to help those that are eligible get all of the uh, assistance that they need. So, um, so please ask the questions and let us help you. And um, if we don't have the answers, we can always uh, ask all of our partners to, to get the answers for you. So thank you all. I think I just want to uh, point out that, you know, the, the preventative care and wellness is one of the most important uh, aspects of, uh, of the Affordable Care Act. You know, people who have chronic illnesses and can only afford to go to the doctor once or twice a year just get sicker. Um, as the councilwoman said, uh, you know, we have a generally sicker population, you know, people who take care of themselves and get screened for conditions and are healthier uh, don't miss work and they don't miss school as much and they get a better education, they live longer. Um, this affects every, every part of people's lives. And uh, for me, I think that the, the preventative care and the screenings and the, the wellness uh, will just lead to an overall healthier population for those who take advantage of it. I would just like to encourage um, everyone to explore their options. So um, it, it really is uh, minimal in the, the, the time investment that, that, that you have to spend to, um, to simply see what's available to you and your family. And, and I, I think that goes especially for folks who are uninsured or, or underinsured. Um, I, I think it's important that, um, as I mentioned before, we, we, we turn off the, the, the TVs and the radios and, and not listen to the talking heads, but, um, but find out for ourselves. And, um, and, and so the, this is the tool um, that, that we have been given um, at this current time to, um, to help um, solve this problem that, that we have in this, this country and our community of, of folks who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, and as Dr. Science mentioned when we first started, um, in, in Bear County, we have over 300,000 uninsured, and so one in five for the general population, and uh, one in four for, for the Latinos here in the room. So I, I guarantee you we have uh, friends and family members who are uninsured. 
So, um, so after you explore your own options and educate yourself, I, I encourage you to um, talk to your friends and family members about it and, uh, and make sure we're taking care of our community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. So if we can give the round of applause to our, to our panelists. And now what we'd like to do is uh, open it up for the, uh, to the audience if they have any questions or uh, issues that they want to address. Uh, and if you can step up and uh, identify yourself and then uh, uh, pr uh, ask your question or your co uh, provide your comment. Don't be shy. All right. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Juan Mejia, and uh, currently I'm in a college. I'm a college student, and I was wondering, is there a penalty for not having insurance? There is a penalty uh, for uh, people who do qualify for the insurance but choose not to take it. But there are also there are exceptions to every rule. Uh, if if you do not make uh, if if the cost of the insurance is more than eight percent of your income, you're exempt uh, from a penalty. Um, there are hardship rules. Um, uh, Many times, you know, college students who don't have uh, much income at all will uh, may be exempt. Um, so there, there is a penalty. Um, I think it's ninety-five dollars a year for the for the first year for an individual. Um, but like I said, the the care the healthcare has to be affordable for your situation, and if it's not, you're exempt. Um, there's a whole list of reasons for for people to be exempt, but. I just said, uh, Dr. Sines mentioned earlier, especially for young folks, there, there are groups out there encouraging young folks to, to take the penalty, that, that it, um, it, it's going to wind up uh, being a lower cost in the long run uh, throughout the year than, than having um, insurance, even if it's the, uh, the catastrophic insurance. And so um, to, to that, we've been telling our young folks that, um, that essentially when you take the penalty, you're paying and uh, you're not getting anything in return. And um, and so I, I think it's a much better decision to um, to go ahead and make the investment um, in your own health and uh, and and uh, cover yourself, have that peace of mind in case something does happen. Uh, um, you, you'll be able to take care of yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a question or comment? Thank you. My name is Roberto Escobedo. And I have a question on the, the penalty also. When and how is a penalty applied? Because I know this is a big uh, scare factor that is being used by the people that are, who are opposed to this plan. So could you answer that question for me? Um, it's the the uh, penalties are assessed when you file your taxes. Um, and the same with the subsidies. If you qualify for assistance, you have the option of uh, accepting a, assistance uh, at the time you enroll in the insurance so that it's applied against your premium, or you can wait till the end of the year when you file your taxes to get a credit back. Because if there's change in your income, either more or less, it may change what you qualify for. Um, but the, the penalties will be assessed when you file your taxes. Federal tax. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay. I hesitate uh, coming to the microphone because I am a member of the government as well with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in D.C. Uh, my role down here is to help and assist in any way the department can in having this uh, plan implemented. Um, and I've been in the Valley, and I've been here in San Antonio, in El Paso. Um, and we have some great, great organizers, uh, great presentations, navigators, et cetera. Um, my, my, what I see missing is the audience. That is, how are we getting the word out for that? So when you have these type of uh, assistance programs, informational programs, that you get more of a mm -hmm. participation from the community. Uh, Univision is a great 
uh, was made, did very well in Houston. They filled up the convention center in Houston, but for one day. Um, but getting, put, putting that aside for the moment, mm -hmm. my question is to Dean Sines. Uh, is UTSA an exception in the um, higher educational efforts uh, with regard to ACA? Um, this is the first one I've seen hmm. that hosts something like this. And it, to me, it would be also important if the various community colleges and the various universities uh, took it more. I mean, became more involved with this effort to mm -hmm. enroll and to participate in this uh, rollout mm -hmm. of ACA. And that question is for, for you, because I think you would know whether UTSA is an exception, is University of Texas in Austin doing it, mm -hmm. is University of Texas at El Paso doing it, um, because I think that would make a big, big difference. Mm -hmm. Students would trust, that is if they trust the administration, your own, right. their own administration. Right. Uh, um, we had that problem when I was in college. So, mm -hmm. uh, But, you know, during the anti-war movement, mm -hmm. where did all that effort come from? But from the universities. Yeah. So anyway, that's my question. Okay, yeah. And uh, I think that um, as you tr find information about what's going on and so forth, a lot has to do with websites and, uh, and so forth, a lot of uh, listserv programs. And in many ways, I haven't heard that there are uh, many universities that have been engaged in this kind of activities. Here in the, in the College of Public Policy and the uh, Center for Policy Studies that uh, Roger Enriquez is the director who's uh, taking pictures over here, uh, and one of our primary uh, objectives is community engagement and getting people out involved in, in talking about uh, issues affecting the community so that we've done, for example, at uh, town hall forums with the San Antonio Express News on immigration reform. Uh, um, Congressman Lloyd Doggett also did a um, uh, town hall meeting uh, that uh, was also pretty successful uh, on, on a relative scale. We probably had about 125 people that showed up and so forth. So these are our efforts, I think, that, that the College of Public Policy and the Center for, for Policy Studies have tried to engage uh, that, that kind of community relations. And I think with uh, partners like uh, uh, each of the uh, panelists here, that this has been something that, uh, that slowly and surely we're, we're gaining a little bit more success. But I totally agree with you in terms of in order to have a major kind of impact, you really need broader kind of uh, participation and getting the word out. Uh, the mass media, obviously, is uh, Univision and so forth, represents a, a, a very useful uh, vehicle for bringing about those kind of, uh, of activities. But I appreciate the question. Uh, I'll just um, elaborate really quickly on, on colleges and universities, at, at least from the standpoint of Enroll America. And so um, we have been able to partner with, um, with uh, local universities, uh, community colleges. Um, I, I know, Luis, that you've traveled uh, up and down the, the border region. Um, Texas A&M International and Laredo has been a, a very a good partner for us, the, the Laredo Community College System, um, UT Pan Am in, um, in Edinburgh has been great. Um, UT, in, uh, UT Austin has, has done several events. Um, you know, UTEP let our folks um, um, speak to, um, to students and, and, um, and other adults at their, at their football games. We were essentially tailgating with them and, and, and disseminating information. So um, in, in uh, February, we have plans to um, to essentially hold um, a week-long enrollment sessions at, at St. Philip's. So I, 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 I do want to share that, that uh, we have found some, some good partners in, in universities. Um, I, I definitely agree that, that we can ramp up efforts and, and definitely use um, universities as a, as a way to get out information to the broader community. And, and I know for us, um, we are a volunteer-based organization, and we have found that, um, that a lot of our college students um, here in San Antonio and throughout South Texas have, been, have made uh, amazing volunteers for us. Uh, in fact, um, uh, one of our, our paid staffers is a, is a current UTSA student. So. And I was, I was also reminded that we're being uh, broadcast here by uh, filmed by uh, Nowcast uh, so that this will be available uh, beyond beyond this room as well. Okay. And any other comments? Okay. Um, 
Uh, I just wanted to, um, I guess, challenge the, um, the panel to encourage um, private uh, insurance agents to, uh, to get certified, because mm -hmm. that is a, an army of folks that um, not only locally but nationally could really help enroll America. And uh, I was talking to an HHS official this week that had come in from D.C., and I believe just nationally there's only 500 insurance, uh, private insurance agents participating. Uh, there is a certification process, and uh, I encourage you all to encourage other insurance agents uh, to get certified and possibly to invite them to the table uh, during enrollment times, because I think that would be awesome. I think everybody pretty much has an insurance agent somewhere. Uh, they're not all certified, but I do encourage you know the partners here to uh, to to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Come on. My name is Miguel. I work here at UTSA, and uh, I was thinking there is a saying that says that the best medication is the doctor himself or herself. When I get insured through ACA, who chooses my physician or my providers? Do I choose them or does the insurance uh, uh, choose them for me? And how many of, what percentage of the medical profession is behind the health, the ACA? So that uh, when I choose ACA, I know that my doctor with whom I have an established relationship already will be there. The insurance company does not choose your doctor for you, but uh, based on the kind of plan you choose, if you choose an HMO plan, then you're going to be limited to, uh, you might be more limited to which providers are in the network, or if, or uh, with an HMO, the, the primary care doctor that you choose um, has to manage your care within, within the network that, that is available. Um, there are PPO plans, which give you more uh, options as far as um, who you can see and, and, and what the steps are to see, for example, a specialist. But the plans that we have in Bear County uh, include Community First. Um, there's a plan by Superior, which is another large uh, company, uh, Blue Cross, Aetna, and Humana. So those are very large uh, companies that most providers participate with. I can tell you that with CommuniCare, we participate we already participated with all of those plans before ACA came along, so we're going to continue to participate. Um, if you're already seeing a physician, you can find out from their office. Um, I know with Blue Cross that we had to opt in. Um, with Humana and Aetna, they just automatically added us as providers, um, and that happened with, with the other plans as well. Uh, so the plans that are available uh, have very large networks of providers. So you should not be limited, and you always are have the ability to choose your doctor. Thank you. You're okay, welcome. thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, then we'll give another round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> and again... Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out, and uh, I remind you that we have the counselors out there for individuals who want to enroll. Uh, we also have uh, the flu shots and a variety of other services, and don't forget we also have the raffle that is going on. So the first table